<laughs> um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for coming and for those who are tuning in. Um, we're excited to be able to offer this brown bag as a part of our Clean Cities activities. Um, Clean Cities goal is to reduce petroleum consumption in the transportation sector. So when we're talking about all fuels, it's hard to talk about um, potential in Vermont without talking about biodiesel. So we're really excited to have Jim Molloy here today to be able to talk about what he's doing with his new biodiesel facility in Plainfield. Um, Jim's worked in the area of biodiesel for over a decade and has had a lot of success in other states here in New England. So we're excited that he is bringing this talent to Vermont. Um, and I will open it up to him to sort of talk about his new company, his experience with biodiesel and sort of where he sees Vermont in the biodiesel picture. So thank you again for hey, joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for being here. Um, so right now, um, Blackberry Biodiesel has been collecting for two years, collecting waste vegetable oil from local restaurants. It was really important for us to focus on feedstock acquisition to start this process. But to start this process, it'd be good for me to know why you're here and what your interest is in biodiesel. And because I don't want to talk you know, tell you stuff you already know. Hi, um, I'm Anna Schultz. I'm a graduate student in the public administration program here. And I also <coughs> work um, here with TRC, doing research mostly related to adapting bridges to climate change. But also, um, my brother is a huge gearhead, and he, for the last five years, has been making things run on vegetable oil and driving around. Um, so I, I kind of had this interest based on, you know, his obsession with it. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, Jim Dunchy, I'm a master's student in environmental engineering here. And um, along with these two guys over here, we uh, work in the transportation air quality lab and we study biodiesel emissions as one of our projects. And particularly Tyler and I are into the particles that come out of there. So, okay. so as Jim just said, I'm Tyler Bradley. I'm a graduate student and I study particle number of emissions from uh, a diesel and from a uh, various plants of biodiesel. Uh, yeah, I'm Jim Sullivan. I'm a research analyst here at the Transportation Research Center. Uh, I'm just interested in, from a research perspective, you know, what we don't know about biodiesel. Okay. I'm Larissa. I'm an undergrad at UVM and I just want to learn more. <laughs> Uh, Karen Sentak, I'm a research specialist here at the TRC, but came to the TRC by way of the Transportation Air Quality Lab, so done a little bit of work on the biodiesel emissions project um, that these guys were speaking to, and watched them go through the hassle of trying to get the fuel blends and feedstocks that they wanted to do the research that they were so. Jacob Leopold, I work here at the TRC. My interest sort of comes along with Jim and just sort of paying attention and also with this sort of learning more as a project manager. Zach Borst, I'm a staff member here. Uh, I'm the outreach person. Um, so I usually set up this stuff, but uh, I'm also very interested in alternative fuels and, and options that are you know, going to be available in the state. Eric Garza, uh, my appointment is actually with the Rubenstein School. Um, when I was doing my doctorate here years ago, I did a study on uh, energy return on investment of biodiesel in Vermont, looking at a bunch of different producers, including a waste oil producer and a bunch of farms that produce virgin seed. And that study just became a book chapter that I got a complimentary copy of days ago. So I'm still interested in the, in the topic. Great. Okay, so this is fantastic. I'm glad I know this about all of you. So I am not an engineer, I'm not a chemist, I am not a researcher. Most of my numbers that I come up with, I'd say 42% are made up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm an activist, I'm an entrepreneur. I'll give you a little background story and then integrate you know, how it all works with uh, biodiesel. About 12 years ago, Sick of paying bills, sick of paying rents. I decided, uh, spending way too much money supporting the infrastructure that I opposed. I thought there was way too much pollution happening with our energy, so I thought, I'm going to move outside and so I can build my own house of natural substances and have it off the grid. <clears throat> so I spent four years 
uh, working on trails in Alaska, Hawaii, and in Vermont. So I was able to save up enough money to get myself a yurt and uh, 10 acres and found a wonderful partner. We decided we're going to build a house out of cob, clay, sand, straw. We didn't want to use any petroleum in the creation of our home. So we had this dream that we were going to have dance parties to mix the material <laughs> and build a home. So we spent six months digging a hole seven feet down, 30 feet across by 26. Then hand stacked a foundation with rope, rocks from the local area. <clears throat> so we had to get it ready and primed for these dance parties. We need to move the material to our site. My wife had this great idea, it's about 12 years ago. She said, well, we can recycle local restaurant oil and retrofit diesel vehicle to move our materials. Now, I thought that was crazy. Now, the, all the rest of it seemed totally sane to me. But running a diesel vehicle on vegetable oil seemed crazy. <laughs> well, she and her friend retrofitted this vehicle we were able to move the materials to our site. We had amazing dance parties with over 500 volunteers in one summer. <clears throat> now, there is a gigantic amount of petroleum used because people from Quebec, Ontario, Nova Scotia, New Jersey, Rhode Island, all came to our place to be a part of this dance party for the revolution, right? We built this house mortgage-free, wind, solar-powered, so at the age of 35, I found myself mortgage-free, uh, off the grid, and tons of energy, but nothing keeping me busy, right? So we had an orchard, that was good, my wife had the idea. I should talk to my family. My family has had a petroleum business in Rhode Island since 1935. So over a couple of beers, I put the uh, idea forward to my brother and father that they should run biodiesel in all of their fleet. So at first they're like, you know, this is Rhode Island. That crazy stuff will work in Vermont, but it would never work in Rhode Island. It's like, you know, I, there are so many progressives in Rhode Island and so many people who want to make a difference but don't know how. And what I found from having 500 volunteers is hearing that story. So many people want to do something good, but they just they feel like their hands are tied. So after a couple of beers, they decided to give me the $5,000 loan to move forward with a biodiesel program in Rhode Island. <clears throat> I got a tank, got some fuel from the Midwest. It was a soy-based biodiesel. And so I made the mistake when I first called the Midwest farmers and said, you know, this isn't GMO crop, right? And they're like, oh, no, it's not GMO crop. It's like, all right. So we get the biodiesel. We start running our fleets. Within one month, we got more attention than our business had had in 75 years. We got an award from the governor, an award from the province city council, and all of this free advertising. It was fantastic. So we were just doing this because we wanted to reduce our emissions. It was big. Asthma is really big all across the states, but specifically down in that armpit. We have uh, some nephews and cousins who are hockey players who are really struggling with asthma. And I thought, you know, we can at least make a difference. And so we move forward with biodiesel in our own fleet. Then I started looking, you know, uh, federally, is there any incentives? And I saw that if you blended biodiesel, you could get a blender's credit. This is going back about nine, 10 years ago. So I realized <clears throat> they're pretty vague about what you needed to do to blend biodiesel. So we got our little magic wand, dipped it in petroleum, waved it over the biodiesel, <laughs> and then B99 was created. And then the word we all across the country found that other people had the same idea. Like we could get this biodiesel blenders credit by just sprinkling petroleum on it. It's fantastic. So there was a back then it was a 50 cent tax credit, which then made it affordable. We then moved it forward into 
the transportation sector. We had plenty of diesel customers uh, and off-road, on-road, construction. They all found that, one, the emissions coming out were cleaner for all that off-road equipment. Uh, all of the workers enjoyed it much more. They enjoyed a, a much better price. So we continued to move forward. And so, you know, we're met with obstacles down there. One, you know, is to kind of make my engines seize. And we had to show them through our own efforts that we wouldn't put biodiesel into our $120,000 fuel trucks if it didn't work. And so it was really important that we led by example. The other thing that I hear all the time <clears throat> is, well, you can't use it year round. You know, we're here in New England. Um, just a quick check. Who here supports PV solar? Great. So, you never hear this with PV solar. If every day is sunny, still six months out of the year is dark. It's night, right? So you never hear that with PV that well, geez, we can't use it because half the year is night, right? With biodiesel, we'd always get this. And so I'd use that example, usually crack a few smiles, and people would give it a chance. So in the beginning, I was pretty extreme, as you can tell, with uh, building a house without petroleum, having dance parties. I realized I needed to get this message out to the mainstream. <clears throat> so it's crucial to start to blend more than the magic wand would do with D99. Once we offered it out to the masses at 5%, 20%, we're able to change over 4,000 customers who have been petroleum users to biodiesel within one year. That impact had, uh, there was more than a million gallons of petroleum displaced. It's fantastic. Um, and then all of a sudden, that biodiesel credit disappeared. But, unbelievable, George Bush came up with the renewable fuel standard, mostly to support the corn ethanol industry. But there's this little trickle down to the biodiesel industry. Through renewable fuel standard, there's renewable identification numbers. So, mostly, these were being used by Archer Daniel Midland. But I realized that even I could take part in that program. So, we had, um, through the renewable fuel standard, companies who would refine petroleum were required to offset their pollution by supporting the renewable fuel standard, which meant they either had to create their own biodiesel, create their own ethanol, or pay for these credits from people like me. So it was the craziest time. All of a sudden, I'm getting checks from Halliburton, <laughs> and we ended up getting a half million dollars from Halliburton to undercut petroleum prices. It was phenomenal. So we worked, you know, using the renewable fuel standard and the identification numbers to pass on a better product, a domestically made product, uh, you know, cleaner emissions, and we undercut petroleum, which unfortunately, you really have to do in the fuel sector. It seems like with solar, you know, if people just like to feel good and have the solar panels, but with petroleum or petroleum uh, alternatives, it's always about pennies. And it's amazing how people react to pennies. So we made sure that we took advantage of every program possible to make sure we're undercutting petroleum. So renew renewable fuel standard, the prices sort of came down, the biodiesel credit uh, disappeared for a couple of more years. In Rhode Island, we worked with uh, legislators who thought it would be a great idea um, that we make biodiesel made within the state exempt from motor fuel tax. And you know, the argument was we need, we need some advantage because we're competing with OPEC. And it's different than solar. They don't have to compete with the giant energy companies. But in the fuel sector, we are competing on pennies and we need every bit. So the argument was we would provide them uh, this great story, but also the uh, green uh, manufacturing sector of the business would grow and their income tax they'd get back. So they'd miss some on the uh, motor fuel tax, but they would get more income tax. So, 
I pretty much made that up. It wasn't like I studied it or thought it out. I had no numbers. I just threw that out there because I'm dealing with politicians. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> turned out I was right. We ended up adding over 50 jobs in two years um, by having the motor fuel tax exemption. We continued to undercut uh, patrolling. So <clears throat> moving forward. Uh, a lot of my work, I never thought I would spend as much time in D.C. as I do. But, you know, we're down there and we're working with the senators and the reps because we need the renewable fuel standard to expand. And five years ago, they came out with the renewable fuel standard too. So much better than the Bush one because it actually recognized that biodiesel was an advanced biofuel where ethanol wasn't. So the value of the biodiesel was seven times greater than the value of the ethanol. That was an amazing boom to the business. And without the tax credit, there's no burden on the taxpayer, which made me feel better. But the burden was on the petroleum companies to pay this higher price for the renewable identification numbers. And for it all, we never got greedy. We kept on just investing in the infrastructure, undercutting petroleum, going with higher blends, and really pushing the boundaries. Again, the, we're not researchers. Like I had a team of service techs, you know, guys mostly with GEDs who really like to play around with burners. And we tweaked oil burners, and we didn't have to do much to burn higher blends of biodiesel. The more biodiesel we sold, the more renewable identification numbers we got, the more money we got, the easier it was to undercut petroleum with petroleum's money. So as an activist, an entrepreneur, that's fantastic. So, you know, we continued facing all of these issues, but I feel like we kept on coming up with creative solutions. And it's an industry where we're constantly fighting for our lives because federally we get the tax credit, but it disappears. Then the renewable fuel standard is shaky at times. 80, I believe it's 88% of all biodiesel businesses have gone out of business in the past decade. So two types of businesses have survived. Uh, the giant ones like Archer Daniel Midland and then the scrappy waste oil collectors like myself. And we have, we're all over the country, mostly coastal, Maine, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Washington, California, and Oregon. But we have found by having our own feedstock in the same way Archer Daniel Midland has their own feedstock, we're able to produce really good fuel and really good prices. So, um, <clears throat> what brings me to Vermont? Well, I've lived here for 20 years, and when my son was three years old, he said, Daddy, you should have a biodiesel business here. And I was like, well, you know, the numbers aren't right, I'm like, we don't have population density, there's no feedstock, and it's like, okay, he bought that. So, <laughs> when he was five, he said, Daddy, you should have a biodiesel business here. And I'm like, no, the numbers aren't right. And he said, I get to see you more. And I was like, okay, done. I'll try it. So looking at Vermont, you know, we're still faced with challenges that we're faced with Rhode Island. have uh, regional connections with all the biodiesel processing plants, the, the ones that just produce small amount of gallons each year, one to 10 million. Uh, I know they need feedstock. Um, and in looking at biodiesel in Vermont, you know, there's challenges because it's even colder than Vermont. But again, like the example for solar, it's okay that we don't do B100 year round. You know, we can blend it. Um, I am Black Bear Biodiesel. Part of it is I think it's a, a great symbol for a scavenger. You know, I'm thinking about giving a name to a company, a scavenger company, is either rats, vultures, <laughs> or black bear. Um, and then with black bear. The other thing is, 
my beer's hibernating. You know, it's okay. So in this whole model, I know we're not going to be selling our products in the winter, but we're still out there acquiring our feedstock. So I don't know if any of you caught the Black Bear biodiesel story in the news. I did. Great. <laughs> awesome. So I'll just give a quick little rundown. This is another reason that I was excited to bring it to Vermont. There's a guy, R.L. Valley. <clears throat> he is the former ambassador to Slovakia appointed by George W. Bush. Aro Valley owns uh, Maple Fields. He goes into places, buys two mom and pop gas stations, turns one into a super mega gas station, and then shuts the other one down. Aro Valley chose to do that in Plainfield, Vermont. So at the same time my son put me up to the challenge, I heard a lot of my townspeople very upset by what RL Valley was going to do and take away the competition. And I thought, now is the opportunity. This is perfect because we can buy the land right next to him. <clears throat> we're going to start this little fight and we're going to have tremendous community support. Free advertising, it's going to help us tremendously. So we bought the land next to him. Uh, went in the permit process in three phases. Uh, the first phase was yellow grease collection and processing, which I knew would go under his radar. Uh, so we got our permit. We started our collections business. Then we went for our permit for food and fuel distribution. Well, when he buys the properties, the two properties, he usually strips the tanks and the dispensers out of the other property and puts it for sale. And he puts it for sale with the caveat there's no food or fuel. So this is perfect. So we baited Goliath into picking a fight with us, which of course he did. At that point, we had no plans or desire to actually distribute. We weren't even close to being ready. <clears throat> but this was fantastic because we got on the radio, we got it in every newspaper, there are tons of stories about how this guy was trying to shut down our business. Well, at this time, we were collecting oil, we're getting tons of press and tons of great connections in the Vermont restaurants. We're doing the yellow grease processing, getting it ready, reactor ready. I already have all the other processors around New England who I've been partnered with for a decade. So we had an outlet to just move it out of state, process it into biodiesel. And uh, as you know, and as you probably can tell by my smirk, we beat him. So we beat him in the town. He took us to state. We beat him in environmental court. Uh, he then appealed again in town, and we beat him. And so I really, that really intrigued. Like, why do I want to start a biodiesel business in Vermont? One, to make my son happy. <laughs> Two, to beat the bully. And uh, three, to provide an affordable fuel for local loggers, farmers, and people trying to stay warm. And so our grand opening is on May 23rd, which I'll come. We're gonna have a nice beer tent there. Um, but in how to make biodiesel successful here, it isn't as easy in a, as it is in Rhode Island. In Rhode Island, we have population density. There's a ton of tourists uh, supporting tons of fried fish shacks all across Rhode Island. So we can't just base what we're doing on fuel here in Vermont. So the idea at our place has been sort of like Plainfield's finest. So we have farm to food stands. So we have vendors there. We have a farmer's market. Um, so we're going to be able to support our local farmers, have our local support, farmers support us, and again, have this focus on community focus. So I didn't pick my title, but Abby did. I didn't, I didn't look at the description of what I was talking about, it's all good here, sorry. <laughs> but I figured it'd be the same no matter what, uh, pretty close. So that is part of you know, how we're gonna make it in biodiesel here, is we're not just doing biodiesel. We're really focused on a community space um, and give back to the farmers who give 
to us and have, uh, I guess, not legally barter, but there'll be plenty of barter, just like in creating a house that is mortgage free. I know a lot of people have a lot of gifts to share um, that are always taxable. Anyway, that's my two cents, and I love questions. And if you have any questions about particulate matter, I'm going to read your pictures of that guy or that guy. I'm going to be a lot more boring than your story. <laughs> yes. Since there isn't, uh, you know, the friars and stuff in Vermont to support a large business, have you looked into uh, getting uh, a bean, like a, a cover crop, and processing your own feedstock? Well, you know, um, do you know Nataka White? Yeah. Okay, so Nataka is looking into that. And so I've been talking with Nataka not in the past few months, but he was talking about creating a food grade oil going into the restaurants and then collecting it out of the back end. And so there is enough oil to support a small business in Vermont. Mm -hmm. You know, we collect 100,000 gallons annually and we're only two years into this and so we should be able to collect about a half million gallons which in the big picture that's no silver bullet solution that's okay like i think of the silver buckshot solution where we all need to do something and as long as we're doing something it's important i think um a half million gallon a year business will be able to sustain about 12 employees um, and then we'll continue having farm stand and you know farm to food truck vendors. And you're actually doing the process on your plant field? So we do uh, the filtration and we get it reactor ready. Um, so in the 10 years I've been in this business, like I said, 88% of all biodiesel businesses go under. The, for a 100,000 gallon a year biodiesel plant, it's about a million dollars. So as we're taking on uh, RL Valley, we knew we'd be out of business for two years just battling him. So we didn't want to put anybody else's, I don't have a million dollars, I didn't want to put anybody else's million dollars on the line. So, we're building it up towards processing, but currently I can have 100,000 gallons a year processed uh, either in New Hampshire, Connecticut, Massachusetts, or Rhode Island for about 23 cents a gallon. So in the industry, we call it tolling. So we just send it out in a truck, it goes through their plant in one day, and that trailer comes back. And so it's like just running it through a toll booth. Um, so we're not going to process until we actually have our own money. I don't want to spend anybody else's money until you know we have to do it for our grounding. And again, with watching all the people go out of business, I have formed great alliances with these small producers, and I like our relationship. <laughs> and it's really nice because I know they need the feedstock to go through their plants. Can you describe what was the family business that originated all of it? Was it delivery of fuel? Yeah, so it was a business my grandmother started in 1935. She was a college graduate and was smart enough not to put her name on it, but a man's name on it, T.H. Malloy. And, uh, but she ran the books, and it was a home heat delivery business. Okay. Um, and she had my grandfather driving like a dump truck in the summer. So the home heat business in the 70s, no 80s, expanded into um, diesel delivery. We had kerosene pumps on site since the 1940s or 50s. And that was actually uh, a big part of uh, getting the fuel out there was when the barrel price went to $1.50, I changed over all the kerosene pumps to deliver biodiesel. We're undercutting petroleum by $1.50 a gallon. So we had people coming from far and wide um, to buy our biodiesel. So it is still a home heating company, but we now blend all of our gallons with biodiesel. Um, 
Oh, and this is another important aspect I sort of jumped over. So in the beginning, you worked with uh, soy. But a year into it, after I asked many times over, and I used to have this personal thing about supporting or treating midland and genetically modified crops, and I kept on saying to the salesman, you know, is this genetically modified? And he'd be like, oh no, oh no. And then one day I asked the salesman, I said, what's GMO stand for? <laughs> and then he's like, uh, I'll get back to you. And I was like, oh shit. So <laughs> I then found somebody locally, right as I was about to get out of the business. And it was a job I never applied for. It just happened over a couple of beers and I started going to Rhode Island for oysters and good conversation. I then found somebody who was collecting waste oil and had a small, like, 40,000 gallon a year plant. And I told them I'd buy all of their fuel. And they said, over a year or two. And I said, this week. And so Newport Biodiesel then knew they had a distributor. And so they've now expanded to be a 10 million gallon a year plant. Um, and so now we, because they've expanded to 10 million gallons, we blend in biodiesel gallons into all the home heating fuel, all the transportation fuel, and try to push to the highest blends possible. Are most of the transportation customers like construction, farm? Um, no, uh, yeah, well, construction for sure. Uh, there are tons of farms down there, but there is some farm. Um, we deliver to the marine sector, so fishing boats, yep. Um, into generators, you know, like the companies like Raytheon. Um, then we also, uh, there's, so there's home heat and the transportation. We have tons of just small vehicles, small fleets, landscaping companies, septic companies, uh, long haul trucking companies. And uh, so there's this one long haul trucking company, Donata Trucking out of Woonsocket, Rhode Island. They burn B99. Um, they were pulled over at a New Jersey way station. The New Jersey troopers gave the test for emissions and thought the whatever gauge they're looking at was wrong. So they brought in a new one. That was wrong. Then they accused Donata Trucking of rigging, altering their system in some way <laughs> to deceive these gauges. They're like, no, it's just B99. So, yeah, they're one of our favorite long haul. Just really pushing the boundaries with pure biodiesel. Is there a ASTM certified product for sale in Plainfield? Uh, not today, but in four weeks. So I can drive my little TDI over there. And Absolutely. Fill up my tank. Yeah. So you have a pump out and everything? Uh, in four weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it took a while to battle RL Valley. We finally beat them on, I think it was December 21st. At that point, it wasn't the time to do the construction yeah. to build our dispensers. And what are you going to be selling? A B20 or a B5? Or no, a B100. Okay, so that would have to go straight into the tank. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, I drive a 2011 Gulf. I am on, I think, B90 right now. Filled up in Rhode Island with the 100 and just splashed in a little. Um, there are a lot of myths about not using pure blends, but I have 100,000 miles of high blend use in that car. Um, we're going to move. We're going to move to a B20 down the line a little bit, but we took us so long to beat RL Valley in this first round that I knew if we had any diesel blends, he promised us that he would fight us to the end. And so he's already made his next move. Um, he is now trying to have the land behind us declared a wetland. And he said he has a strong environmental ethic. He, before he sells his property, he wants to make sure it's in good hands. And as a steward, he would really want to make sure that the wetlands around any of his properties are declared. So, being such a sweetheart and an environmentalist, our Valley is now pushing uh, that. So we'll see. So I can see when we do go to a blend, there's going to be another battle. So, trying to do things in steps. 
and wants to make sure we can stay in business. And so, step one, be 100. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, what's your experience taking an old diesel vehicle and switching it over to B100? Um, so, like I've heard that the uh, the uh, you know um, turpentine or like the uh, it'll clean out the system and you get a lot of clogging of fuel filter. Yeah. Here's the thing. That was true ten years ago when the diesel fuel was much dirtier. But diesel fuel right now is super clean. And so there isn't that issue because the super clean diesel is now cleaned out the tank. The issues we come across are in heating systems where oil heat is still dirty. And so when you put a high blend biodiesel in, it works as a solvent and then it goes up through the system and then clogs your nozzle then shuts your system down. But in cars, haven't found an issue unless the car hasn't run in 10 years. But and that's probably going to have other issues. So 2001 Volkswagen that's been running on diesel should have no problem. Oh, no problem whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, you've been burning ultra low sulfur diesel, um, and actually it'll help with the lubricity, yeah. because it's great to have the sulfur out with emissions, but also that's the lubricator. So I have a question. Sure. We're trying to figure out how a biodiesel can be a widespread part of our fuel sector here in Vermont. Mm -hmm. So you're offering this B100. How do we get it out? If people want to use it. What's the next steps look like? Yeah. Well, you know, again, for us in Rhode Island, it was leading by example. That was crucial, and showing that you know the B100 can work. Um, and so, what's the next steps? So promoting um, Northern Star Award winner. Thank you, uh, Vermont. Uh, UVM, let's see. So UVM, City of Boston, uh, City of Nashua, Oakhurst Dairy, and me got the Northern Stars Award uh, for from Clean Cities as the top displacers of petroleum, yada, yada, yada. So get that story out there, that there are fleets and big fleets that actually use it. And that's crucial because people always think, that it's sort of crazy leftist, like elitist, who are using these alternative energies. But it's not. It's whole cities. It's right wing, left wing, everybody in the middle. It's, it is mainstream. So I think Vermont is cutting edge in so many ways. But that's one way that they're just clueless, is they don't know it's mainstream yet. Iowa does. Indiana does. <clears throat> okay. Um, what about heating oil? I mean, Vermont is colder, and yeah. a lot of people are still on uh, heating oil, especially if you're outside of the natural gas um, yeah. lines in Chittenden and Franklin County. So, is there is that something you're going to try to introduce to the state, or? Yeah, you know, slowly. Um, I do not want to spend tons of money on trucks or anything like that. You know, we're gonna have the product. There's already an infrastructure existing. There are already oil companies. The idea is not me doing it, but working with local companies and getting them to realize that they can do it. And so, yes, I'll be a part of it, but I won't be the one driving the truck or owning the truck that delivers to your house. Um, they just need to know. And here's, here's the other thing that people don't know. When the renewable fuel standard came out, and those renewable identification numbers were attached to all gallons of biodiesel, large petroleum companies blended 5% biodiesel into every gallon that came through New York because they could cash in these renewable identification numbers. So you've been using a B5 in your car for five years. Your oil heat system is a bioheat system. It's already there. So by law, you don't have to report anything under 5%. So the racks, like all of these big distributors, they've already been doing it. So everybody already has it. It already works. And that's the story that I think needs to get out there. I think there just needs to be more stories get out there. This has been in action, and we just need to continue, but above the board. Um, 
So can you just reiterate, you just said that all low sulfur diesel sold at gas stations is actually something close to B5? Yeah. It can be up to up to B5 yeah, without, up to. without having to report it. Yeah, that'd be great. So you should pull some and test it. Because we have, and that, that doesn't say it's B5. It says it's B0. Really? Yeah. Huh. Okay. I'm I'm shocked because we pull okay so we pull out of Providence right we pull out of the Providence racks um, Alston racks and we have it tested all the time because we blend B20 mm -hmm. and so we always find three to five percent in every gallon so we send it through the University of Connecticut uh, monthly yes. yeah. So, right? <laughs> so when you're when you're selling twenty and you find that it's five percent, are you then doing seventeen? No, we're selling the twenty-three. Oh, you are. Whatever. Okay, because that was my other question. Because a lot of the fleets that I've talked to have like will pay the additional or have B five. Yeah. And I'm one, and I always wonder, are they real? Do they really have to pretend they don't know it? They could. Yeah, so I, I'm sorry, I got to jump back to you. I'm, I'm totally shocked. How often have you tested it? I mean, we got one lot of, one large lot of diesel fuel from a local um, supplier, yeah. and we tested it with our LTIR. Both heating fuel, right? No, it was, it was, on, road it was on road okay. diesel fuel, and, uh, and we had a little uh, diesel tester that's supposed to test up to B30, and it said it was, yeah. it was B0. So maybe the, test, the testing process is different. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, there was this one drop in RIN prices. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you bought it in the drop of prices because the prices have fluctuated, but it is definitely cost effective for the racks to blend up to 5%. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I'd be interested if you test it a few more times. I mean, it was only one lot. lot. We, we yeah. only, we, because we were testing, we were wanting to use the same fuel for all of our tests. Oh, yeah. So we bought, like, I don't know, a lot of gallons. Of yeah. 250 gallons. Yeah, a lot for us. Yeah, 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 yeah. 100 gallons. <laughs> so if I just pulled some out of um, a pump, can I bring it to you and have it test, tested? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, yes, you, you, we can test it, but it's not going to be like a government certified test. Yeah, that's, a, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. That would be interesting, though. Yeah. Well, actually, we should probably talk to my advisor. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, portable. <laughs> okay. Um, I like your uh, silver buckshot metaphor. Yeah, but, thanks. Yeah. Um, but I'm just curious, do you see focusing on one sector, like for let's say the transportation sector, do you think biodiesel will be it'd be most effective to try to get it into larger fleets, like long haul trucks? And is there another kind of solution for on road passenger vehicles, or how does it fit into each kind of yeah. section here? So it's to be honest with you, it's all coming together as we speak because I have a day job. I still work in Rhode Island. I still work in Mass, Connecticut. Um, I telecommute mostly. Down there, you know, it depends on the season. For half the year, I'm focused on just getting into the heating systems. And for the other half of the year, I'm focused on getting it out for construction. Here in Vermont, I don't have the same infrastructure, which I do with the family business with 17 trucks putting it out there. Here, we're going to see what it takes. We're going to offer it at the pump. People can come and bring it back to their own homes. We can help them get smaller containers, 50 gallons or 100 gallons. <laughs> but, you know, we generally... Um, this is set up so people can come to us, and this is the way we're going to start. It's uh, easier than going out and getting the $120,000 truck and then needing to pay for that by pushing it out to the transportation sector. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's a work in progress, and I imagine we're going to have locally, I know we have lots of farmers who are coming, loggers, and small vehicles. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to ask, um, how would you organize a distribution system, say, to um, service like SD Ireland if they decided they wanted to run their fleet of construction vehicles on biodiesel? It seems like it'd be a big, a big uh, sale. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so the way I do that is 
told my yellow grease through White Mountain have a tanker truck, swing it around SDR Island, I imagine we'd have tens of thousands of gallons of storage. Mm -hmm. So they're not coming to our cute little pumps. Yeah, that's what uh, I was thinking. Yeah, no, we just have a trucking, local trucking company. It's so much easier, you know, the infrastructure is there. And it's easier to work with other people's stuff and just pay a little bit as you go. And, you know, there a lot of trucking companies are constantly looking for work and keeping people busy. And so it's more cost effective instead of me getting the tanker truck is just to work with local trucking companies. So just be coordinating a yellow grease, like tooling it through and coming back. Okay. Yeah. So you're basically outsourcing the transportation of the fuel. Yeah. Yeah. So one, of, one other issue that I kind of wanted to bring up just to get your thoughts on it, is another role that we play here is we kind of um, do a lot of performance measurement in terms of alternative fuels and, and um, displacing petroleum. And we, we produce uh, periodic uh, transportation energy profile for the state where we just track the use of not only gasoline but diesel but other fuels for transportation and, and what the trends are. And, and, um, and one of the things that's been a challenge with um, biodiesel, but also other um, alternative fuels for transportation is tractor. <coughs> and the, the, the trend in biodiesel with blending seems like it's going to complicate that more and more for us, so particularly when there are blends that don't have to be reported that might be. So we've had to report none yep. up until now. We know that's not necessarily true. Um, and, and so tracking something like biodiesel that is sold and used for transportation in Vermont um, becomes important then because then those trends indicate to the state, this is a very popular policy document in Vermont mm -hmm. for agency transportation and for regulators and legislators, they look at it. And so seeing those trends and then being able to set policy that will try to manipulate those trends and, and encourage what, they have a very progressive comprehensive energy plan for the next 20 years um, is important to us and to them. Um, so I don't know, do you, do you see any light at the end of the tunnel where, I mean, your situation is great because I think it's, it's domestic in, in terms of Vermont, it's, I don't want to call it domestic, but it's sort of, it's there, you're going to really know the gallons, but like in the situation you just described, if it's going then, well, I don't know if we could call the, the product you send out to toll a sole, a sole transportation fuel yet and it's processed maybe in New Hampshire and it's brought directly to SD Ireland and no one has a flow meter on anything that's it's being delivered or tanks being filled or we have to go to SD Ireland and say in this hypothetical example and get rec paper records from that it becomes kind of a nightmare do you have any thoughts on well I mean I would have record you would have record of what of, of, of the entire yeah, chain. Yeah, yeah. Or you would. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm assuming he's getting paid for it, right? Yeah. But 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 from the big, the the, the sort of big fuel companies in terms of blending, um, if they don't report it, we don't know it, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's my frustration. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in Rhode Island, this past year is the first year we ever had to report it. Um, and it's like to the Department of Air Quality, but other than that, it's always just to the tax department. So when they when they get that identification number you were talking about, and they're able to get uh, incentives, yep. To don't they have to report the precise amount of biodiesel that they blended? You know, is it a per gallon of biodiesel incentive? Yeah. So it's actually you get one point five credits for every gallon. Each gallon is tracked by a 37-digit number, um, and the EPA federally tracks all of that. And so my speculation, though, is there aren't any major distributors here in Vermont. Like, 
it's what they're pulling out of the racks in yeah. Montreal or New yeah. York. Those are the ones that's where it's that are blending. Yeah. And so that's where the biodiesel is coming in. So really you really don't know if it's zero to 5% right. uh, here. It won't get reported. It won't get reported at all. Okay. I mean, you know federally, but it doesn't show where it's actually, what state it's going to. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit, well, two things, um, just from talking to fleets and people, there's the concern about that of you know, engines and being making more of a maintenance hassle yep. on things. So can you speak to that? And then also um, talk about the price that you're able to offer it at. Yep. Yeah, so what we found using it for eight years, we actually uh, need to change our filters less. Everything we run is... Uh, and about 2.8% more efficient. Um, and the maintenance, maintenance issues are really non-existent. Um, but it's one of those fears that is put out there, and that's what everybody talks about. And you know, there's the other one that once you start, we'll never be able to find it again. One, if that's true, it doesn't matter because you can switch back to diesel at any point. But secondly, there's, well, not here in Vermont, but everywhere else there's plenty of biodiesel to be had. And that always seems like a big fear that they won't be able to get it. Um, but yeah, it is a little bit of an issue when I hear uh, Burlington DPW is paying 15 cents more per gallon for B5. That just shows that there's no competition here yet because across the country, we're providing biodiesel at or below petroleum price. And I think a, a big part of that will be having those local examples of biodiesel working in mm -hmm. Vermont with fleets. Yep. So is there any efforts underway to, to have like a pilot program here? Yeah, you know, um, we're starting small and simple there in plain fields. You know, it's my part-time job is to run the Black River Biodiesel um, and keeping it local. And so there's just going to be small local fleets. Um, there's Cabot uh, nearby, yeah. but we're going to have to work with somebody else because Cabot's not going to blend high blend biodiesel. So that would be a great place for us to start. Yeah. How long, uh, what's the shelf life of the biodiesel that you guys are making? Yeah, it's over a year. I mean, it's similar to diesel. You can't let diesel sit for over a year. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Right. Well, thanks so much for yeah, my pleasure. sharing your story and helpful information. We'll definitely stay very tuned into the future of Black Bear. Cool. Thanks. And May 23rd, you said? Is May 23rd. Mm -hmm. Yes, some local handmade sausages, some good Hill Farmstead beer. Yeah, cool. You know, I 13.9%. Uh,